good morning, everyone. It's great to be here and enjoying the presence of God together and um, breaking bread together as well. If you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John, we're continuing our series in 1 John, and we've come to chapter 4. I'm going to read a verse from uh, chapter 3 as well at the end. Um, because this chapter division breaks into a thought that is uh, being developed, as you'll find as you read through the New Testament more and more, uh, these chapter divisions aren't inspired by the Spirit in the same way as the actual words are. Um, so let's read together from chapter 3, verse 24, 1 John three twenty-four. The one who keeps his commandments remains in him and he in him. We know by this that he... Rem- <laughs> Whoops. I thought it was a little bit loud. Sorry, Zoli. Can you just take it down a touch? The one who keeps his commandments remains in him and he in him. We know by this that he remains in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. That's a verse about assurance, isn't it? As we heard beautifully last week. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see they are from, whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's a massive verse. We're going to have a look at that a bit later on. Uh, They are from the world, therefore they speak us from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God, the one who knows God listens to us and the one who is not from God doesn't listen to us but by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Father, we pray that as we look at your word together you would help us, you give us wisdom, discernment and Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon us even in your word. We say, God, we are open to you, we need you. And we ask for you to come amongst us in Jesus' name. Amen. So discerning and overcoming. Discerning and overcoming. My first point is this, that love and discernment can go together, belong together. The overriding theme of 1 John, as you know, is the amazing love of God and how that love can transform us, enabling us to love God and to love one another as well. It's an amazing thing. And generally speaking, the, the, this Christian emphasis on love is received and celebrated in, by the non-believing world. That's what they love about Christianity. Christianity emphasizes love. All you need is love, said the Beatles. Yeah, love, love, love. And then they broke up. You've got Larry Norman to thank for that insight. And the thinking goes, and this is where it pushes this principle of love across the line. Love means everything's included. Everyone's view is equally valid. All beliefs, all preferences, all choices. Being loving means there's no judgment. There's no assessment being made of beliefs or behaviours. But that's not how John the apostle of love sees it. He talks about false teachers, as we've just read. That's not how the Bible sees it. That's not how any of the apostles see it. That's not how Jesus himself saw it. In other words, we are exhorted to both love and discern. It's possible to love and to keep on loving while rejecting a teaching or a viewpoint or behaviour that is unacceptable. No. Every parent does this. Every parent knows that this is true. You love your child. Of course you do. But you don't affirm every behaviour. Yeah? It's totally obvious when you begin to apply it. It's only kind of sounds wrong in the realm of concepts that aren't applied into real life. 
It's a wonderful thing when your small child picks up a pen or crayons and begins to draw a scribble and marks or stick men on a piece of paper. It's a different thing if they start doing that on the lounge wall or on a friend's lounge wall or with a cokey on the sofa. You love your child, but you don't accept all behaviours. There was a trend when our kids were very small of, of this kind of resistance to saying no to the child. Don't say no. And it's a little bit embarrassing when your child first begins speaking and one of their first words is no. Um, which can be, you know, share your... That's, you know, let him play with that toy as well. You know, and Christians get confused about this. Maybe the Holy Spirit should just... We should leave the, the, the child to learn from the Holy Spirit what's right and wrong. No, that's why God's given you as the parent to teach and to model. For, and Because you, there's too many dangers to not say no to a child, whether it's putting their hand on the grill of a gas heater or just running into the road. They're, they're, you can love, but you need to know boundaries and you need to be able to discern right from wrong as well. One of my own childhood family stories that's become almost legendary in, in our family was um, one time when our, the children were very small. My mother had three small children. My brother's about six. I'm four. My sister would have just been one. So that's the kind of age. It's the 60s. The latest Beatles record is playing on the radio. He's just come out brand new. Uh, it was that era when, when that rose-tinted era when the front doors were always open, the neighbours were in and out of each other. Anyway, there was a knock at the door and my mother goes to the door and the neighbour says, come quickly. And my mother says, why? What's the problem? It's Nicholas. Nicholas, my older brother, then about six. Mother, what has he done now? Neighbour, just come now, come quickly. My mother goes out into the street. There's a little gathering of children, one or two adults, and they're all looking up. And my mother follows the line of their sight up to my brother, who had scaled successfully the lamppost and was sitting on the lamp at the top triumphantly. Now, I, I, I never remember the end of the story because that was always the punchline. I do seem to remember talking about screaming blue murder. I don't know why murder would be blue, but she was screaming blue murder. And it was like, you could kill yourself, and if you don't, I'll kill you when you get down anyway. So it was like, but she didn't say, what she didn't say was, wow, look everybody, one day he's going to be a mountaineer. You know, it's a lamppost now, it'll be Everest when he grows up. She didn't affirm the behaviour that could have killed him. You need discernment when you're parenting. Every stage of your child's life, all the way through, you know, we, had, we thought we had challenges when our children were at school. It seems to me that those challenges have increased considerably now. The idea that love means that you abandon discernment. Do you get the principle from these verses? He's saying don't believe every spirit. You test, you discern, you assess, you evaluate. The idea that being loving means that you abandon discernment or judgment or the ability to make clear decisions is wrong. You can love and discern. We're not in the dark. God has given us his word. There's a reason why we needed his word. So with, ch with children, we want our kids to love Jesus. That's the main thing. If they, get right with Je if they get right with Jesus and they believe the authority of the Scriptures as a result of that and they, they belong to the community of the church, they've got that value, you know, then we're going in the right direction. But we live in a context where these things are continually being contested. Now, don't be unloving. Don't, whew, just like the chill wind came through just then, don't be like that with people. You're allowed to close these doors, by the way. Um, I'm not saying do it. I'm not saying do it now. I'm not saying do it now. I'm just, I'm freezing here. I want to preach from under there. Um, you, you know, God's given you responsibilities in your life. Your own mind, your own heart, your behavior, what you do with your time, your money, your attitudes, 
If, if you have a spouse, you're responsible for your spouse. If God's given you children, you're responsible for your children. You love, but you be discerning. Love and discernment go together. Love and discernment go together. Now, there are some things where there's wiggle room. In the Christian faith, there's, there's, you are going to do it anyway. Sunil has taken, he's gone for it. Um, there's wiggle room. But there are other areas where there's, there isn't really core doctrines. That was obviously a popular, look at this, the power of the spoken word in action. Um, the doctrine of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's no wiggle room there. That's who God is. There's no wiggle room around the doctrine of humanity made in the image of God, male and female in the image of God. There's no wiggle room around the doctrine of sin and the fall. There's no wiggle room around the doctrine of salvation through Christ. You know, these things are, but, you know, how long should a church service be? <laughs> well, just short enough to be out of, for us to get to coffees before the power goes properly out. You know, how loud should the band be? You, you, know, this is, you know, the diet of the church, the preaching, the teaching diet of the church, these things largely are wisdom issues and largely determined by, by the elders who, who should be listening to people. How long should the introduction of a sermon be? But that's not the introduction. That was actually my first point. <laughs> Love and discernment go together. Second point, the first key that John gives us in this text so I, th I think I'm giving you what he's doing. He's taught about love, but he's teaching about discernment. Two keys to discerning and overcoming. The first is the test of scripture and doctrine, which I've already alluded to really. He's dealing with a specific error, probably not our error that we're dealing with these days because certain so-called prophets or teachers, new age style teachers, were using Christian ideas to draw followers away from the church to themselves. They didn't mind, I mean, they are, they're absolutely outrageous, these guys. They didn't even mind using the names of, of Christian characters in their story building to teach their own thing. John says, beloved, do not believe every spirit. I mean, right there, it's like, yes, God is love, but do not believe every spirit. I mean, it's very clear. But test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. That's the first time I think we've, we've, we've encountered this Antichrist which you've heard is coming and now is already in the world. So he appeals to a core doctrine, doctrine of Christ, to help expose a false teaching about Christ. Now, your understanding of who Jesus is is critically important. It's essential. If you go wrong with your view of Jesus, who Jesus was, you will go wrong everywhere else as far as Christianity is concerned. And the, the, the readers of John's letter were in danger of doing that. Michael Eaton writes, there can be no revelation unless there is a basic orthodoxy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And he lists four essentials from these verses. I'll read them quickly. First, John, uh, sorry, Jesus is the human name of the Saviour. He was born a man given the name Saviour or, or God saves. That's what Jesus means. It's like the Old Testament name Joshua. Secondly, Jesus is Christ. That's Greek, Messiah, Hebrew. He's the promised Old Testament one who would come. He is the anointed one. The one who has the power to accomplish your salvation and the purposes of God. Thirdly, the Son of God existed before he was born as a man. That's one of the most wonderful aspects of the Gospel of John. If you read the Gospel of John, you'll find these delicious insights every now and then to the relationship that Jesus had with the Father before the world was, let alone before he was born, before Abraham was, I am. You know, you, you're, there's many of these lovely statements where you realise, wow, there was this relationship of love between Father, Son and Spirit before creation began, before time was created. And then verse 4, not verse 4, point 4 that, that uh, 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 Eton makes, Jesus Christ came 
in the flesh. So these new age style prophets were saying Jesus was just a spirit. It's, it's the spirit that's important, not the body. What you do with your body isn't that important. You can do what you like with your body. It's, it's the spirit, as long as you're spiritual. Well, you can see where that error is going. Just be spiritual. They argued that Jesus was a celestial spirit, that he hadn't come in the flesh. John says, no. The Bible teaches that Jesus is fully human and fully God. Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He was physically crucified for us and physically rose again from the dead and physically ascended into heaven. God cares for the whole of you, body and soul, all that you are, God cares for you. The spirit of Antichrist, which he mentions, isn't only about emperors and presidents, if they are, but about errors in connection with core doctrine, who Jesus is. The spirit of Antichrist is Antichrist to deny that Christ is God, to deny that Christ was the real man, to deny that Christ died on the cross for your sin, to deny that Christ rose again from the dead. That's the spirit of the anti-Christ. Do not believe every spirit, says John. And so in our day, we need to return to the essentials. You need to become a student of the Bible. You need to become immersed once again, in good theology and good doctrine and getting to grips with Scripture and what Scripture teaches is vitally, vitally important because new heresies, which are essentially twistings of the truth, there's always some kind of a truth in there somewhere, but it's a twisting of the truth. We need to know how to meet those. If you do some any kind of evangelism, you'll soon encounter a wrong idea about who God is or who Christ is or what the Holy Spirit does or what, what the church is and so on. And it's amazing how God will bring verses of Scripture to your mind that you hadn't actually connected to those errors. You don't even know, you don't even need actually to read vast volumes on all the errors and heresies of the cults and all of that that have been. Just read the Bible and you'll find the Holy Spirit will bring to your memory, bring back to your mind answers that you'll have. You'll be able to answer error with truth. So use your discernment. Make judgments according to God's word and learn the whole counsel of God. In your Christianity, don't obsess on one verse or one passage. You know, Learn the whole counsel of God. Get to grips with the, the whole story. John Calvin surprised me when I looked up Calvin. Calvin's always got something good to say where, uh, on the verses which he deals with, almost always. And, and uh, here he surprised me because I thought he would say, yes, and so when there's error, you bring the truth, you bring the word. But actually, he emphasizes the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit when you're encountering and countering heresy. This is what Calvin says. It may be asked how we gain discernment. He, uh, I mean, the translation that I had said, it may be asked, whence comes discernment? But I thought I'd modernize it a little bit. I grant, he says, that doctrines ought to be tested by God's word. But except the spirit of wisdom be present, to have God's word in our hands will avail little or nothing, for its meaning will not appear to us. You need the Holy Spirit to understand the word. Again, that's, that's not unorthodox, that's orthodox. That we may be fit judges, we must necessarily be endowed with and directed by the spirit of discernment, provided we ask, him, uh, we ask for him of the Lord, but the Spirit will only thus guide us to a right discrimination when we render all our thoughts subject to God's Word. And that's kind of alarming, that, that, that you, could, you could have the Scriptures and still not see. And in fact, people used to say, oh, don't copy Billy Graham's, the Bible says. You remember Billy Graham? The Bible says, the Bible says. Because modern people don't accept the authority of the Bible. What's the answer to that? The answer to that is, 
People have never accepted the authority of the Bible, even when they had it in their homes or on the top shelf or even when they were regularly going to, to church. It's only when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes that the Bible says suddenly has authority. That's what Calvin's saying. We need the Word and the Spirit to discern correctly, which leads to the second key to discerning and overcoming, and it's this fabulous verse, uh, verse 4, uh, and the, the key, of course, is the indwelling power of the Spirit. Uh, verse 4, you are from God, little children. That's an amazing contrast. Little children and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. What, what, a, what a verse. I'm not sure who's sufficient to preach on such a verse. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak us from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. The one who knows God listens to us. The one who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And of course, John is speaking as someone representing orthodox Christian teaching when he, when he says that. Um, I, I just love the fact that the Bible doesn't allow us to develop a, a self-image that is that we are under siege and that we need to kind of fight against every aspect of culture and we're, it's all pressing down on us as though we just got to hang on, just got to hang on until Jesus returns. No, the Spirit of God has come. Pentecost happened and it's like, boom, you know, it's like out of the upper room into, onto the world stage saying, we got something that we got a story to tell. Jesus Christ died and is alive from, from the dead. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We're supposed to enjoy our Christianity. We're supposed to enjoy the good things that God's provided for us. We're supposed to enjoy the gospel. There should be a it sounds superficial. The Puritans were, were, were accused of being superficial because they emphasised feelings or affections, emotions, as they, as they call them. Then, but, 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 but if you've encountered God and your sins have been forgiven, how can you live like a slug under a stone? It's not possible. God has done something amazing in your life and, and, and it's, not, it's not arrogance, but greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. He says, you've overcome. He talks as though the battle's been won already, the fight, the struggle. The struggle is past. Victory has been obtained and it's been given to you. The enemy has been defeated. Christ is alive. You're on the winning side. That's the emphasis that, that's, that's coming through. God's power is in you. And, uh, you know, let me just say this. Uh, let's put aside for a second, <coughs> as I get into this next little bit, uh, what you believe about when you receive the Holy Spirit. Let's put that to one side. For, the, for, the, for some of those who have, 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 have experienced powerful moments of the Holy Spirit, you know, that's wonderful. But we need a present day experience of God today. I mean, that can be just as much a danger of saying, no, I got the whole thing when I was converted, even though I felt nothing at all. We're still looking back and saying, that's enough. No, let's not be guilty of grieving the Holy Spirit. That was then. This is now. We need the Holy Spirit now. We need Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right now in the pressures that we're in today with the context, with the teachings and the heresies and all the other stuff that we're, with the current generation of non-believers around us that we want to declare Jesus is alive from the dead. You know, we need, we need Him today. And so how, how could John assume, how could he assume that they had this ability to overcome? And, and to me, the answer is obvious if we read the book of Acts. So I'm, I'm exhorting us not to say this one experience that I had or this one time when I feel that, that was what did it. No, we need God today. Jesus knew that he was leaving vulnerable like little children. He knew he was leaving a vulnerable group of disciples. They are, obviously, they are followers of Christ. They know something of the Spirit already. Of course they do. Flesh and blood didn't reveal to them that he was Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But my Father in heaven revealed it 
to them and they were born again. They were following after him, but they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable there. A couple of times he says to them, do not let your heart be troubled in John 15 and then through to 17. And in John 15, he says, I will ask the Father. This is the key. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. You know, don't you sometimes feel like, I wish I had a helper. I do. Wish I had a helper who'd say, don't say that. That's going to be a problem if you say that. You know, just, and or, or you know, do this or pray for that person. You know, wouldn't you love a helper? And actually when you pray, it's not going to be you or the volume or the words, but I'm going to be doing it. You know, we need a helper. I'll send you another helper, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Again, we've got the same contrast as in John 1, as in 1 John, because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Greater is he is in you. I will not leave you as orphans. So it's Christ in you. I will I am coming to you. So he knew this. And so, of course, shockingly, he's arrested. They, even though he's told them it's all going to happen, they're thrown. He's flogged. He's beaten. They bring him out a bloody mess of skin and blood dripping, a crown of thorns pressed onto his head, mocked purple robe around him. And then, unbelievably, he's sentenced to death. They see him crucified from a distance. The women are closer. They see him, they see him, or is it the other way around? They see him crucified and dies. He dies. They bury him. Joseph of Arimathea and the others, they take him, they bury him. On the third day, he rises from the dead. And you think, wow, the resurrection, that will be enough, wouldn't it? Because he speaks with them, he teaches them, he opens their minds to understand the Scriptures. He goes from, you know, all the Moses and the prophets and the law and he preaches Christ to them. Oh, it's all about me, he says to them. Wouldn't that be enough? No, says Jesus. Something more is needed. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He says that to them after he's been raised from the dead. And again, a second time, as they're like, just before the ascension, that he's saying the kingdom of God's coming. He said, well, when's that going to happen? Is it all going to happen now? Is it all going to be overthrown? He says, no, no. Uh, it's not for you to know periods or times, appointed times the Father set by his own authority. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and as the, at the remotest parts of the earth. And then he ascends to the Father. What is going on? And then they're left. They've got 10 days. I think it's 10 days, right? Between that and then the day of Pentecost, the 50th day. Finally, it happens. The power comes. The power comes. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them just as he promised. They've received this power and the result is almost irresistible. They, they surge out of the upper room and they preach Christ and him crucified, and 3,000 people. The, the, as Peter's preaching, we talked about this last time, I think, they're convicted of their sin. They're cut to the heart. Brothers, what should we do? Repent and be baptised for the forgiveness of your sins. And they, they're swept in to the kingdom of God in, a, in an amazing way. But it's not just that first time that they were filled. That's my point of not just saying the first time. It wasn't just the first time they were filled. Look at Acts chapter 4. It happens again to the same people. So take Peter as an example. He's obviously been filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts, in Acts 3, they, they pray for, well, they don't pray for this guy. Peter pulls this lame man up and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. He walks. They then preach. More people get added to the church. And the religious authorities arrest them. They're, brought, they're sent into prison next morning, come into the Sanhedrin to answer for what they've done. What are you doing? What are you doing? By, uh, they ask him, by what power or in what name have you done this? They were asked. Then Peter, and it's Peter and John, the writer of the letter that we're studying. Peter said, it says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said. So there's another filling. Luke is not saying, and then Peter, sanctified as he was and disciplined in his thinking. No, no, filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus had said, look, they're going to bring you before courts. Don't worry about what you say. I will be with you in that moment. 
That's what's happening here. In that moment, Peter received an effusion of power that enabled him to speak with authority and boldness so that they were astonished and said, well, they recognized they'd been with Jesus. Who, who are these are uneducated men? What is going on? How come they've got such revelation from Scripture? How come they're speaking with such boldness? So they threaten them and they release them. What do they do? You know the story, Acts 4. They go back to the church and like Wednesday night, they have a prayer meeting. They have a prayer meeting and they're praying. What are they praying? They're praying, Lord, stretch out your hand. <laughs> to hear their threats and stretch out your hand to perform healing and signs and wonders through the name of your servant Jesus. And then we read, uh, I've lost my place. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. That's a third powerful filling. It's the same people. It's the same group. They were filled again with the Holy Spirit. And we're only in Acts chapter 4. And of course, I won't go through the whole of the New Testament, but the point is this. The recipients of the letters of the New Testament had experienced these things. It's the same group of people in different churches and you read through the book. So the book of Acts and the epistles need to belong together when we read verses like, greater is he that's in you. You know he's in you. He dwells in you by his spirit. We've got to, what is he talking about? He's talking about what the Bible describes for us, what we see in the book of Acts. Now, the earlier verse that I read in chapter three is a verse about assurance. How do we know that we remain in him? By the spirit who is in us, who's given to us. This verse is about power. Greater is he that is in you than he that is. So it's not a contradiction. There's two things happening here. There's assurance of salvation and there's power for witness. There's power in the context of an unbelieving world. And that's what John is talking. Incidentally, there's an account in the Hebridean revival up in Scotland in the 1940s where after a prayer meeting, the cottage in which they were praying literally shook and there's several people who testified to it happening they heard the crockery rattling in the sideboard and they didn't go out and start a crockery rattling ministry <laughs> you know that's how you can tell the holy spirit's moving the crop you know it's the it's crock rock international ministries now what did they do they went out and preached jesus alive from the dead, and people were convicted of their sin and came to Christ. So the first readers of these letters had experienced these things. And the reason that unimpressive Christians could turn the world upside down in those days, look at the book of Acts, look at the first couple of centuries of the life of the church. How was it that these little children, how was it that unimpressive Christians could bring such change is the same reason that unimpressive Christians like you and me can bring change in the world through, through all history because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And there's a kind of confluence of these things. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the Spirit in us by his power. And even Jesus said, the Father in me does his works. There is this communion between your soul and the triune God. If, if anyone trusts in me, he will come in and we will come in and the old version says sup with him. I don't know what it, what it says in the newer versions. I should have looked it up. But there's this communion between you and the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's like, who do I pray to? The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. You pray to God, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. Who is in me, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? It's the Spirit of God. It's Christ in you. It's the Father doing His works in you. You are united together with Christ. You were dead, but you've been raised to life by the power of the Spirit. And so I want to encourage you, receive more from Him. It puts us all in the same position. 
Holy Spirit, I want more of you. Father, I want to come to you. Jesus, build your character and life in me. I want the power of the Spirit. I want the fruit of the Spirit. I want to love, but I want to discern. And in that discernment, I want to know not to produce arrogance in any way, but we're little children. You know, we're still going to be unimpressive. We, you know, even if you think you're impressive, we're still unimpressive. But greater is in you than he that is in the world. So take heart and believe. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll pray. 